Okay, so we're going to move on to the chapter of power series. Okay, so, so, so far we only dealt with rational functions as an example of homomorphic functions. We shall study other ways of defining such functions. One of the principal ways to mean by power series. So we're going to see something like this, converges all z to find function which is equal to e to the z. Okay, and we shall extend the value of sine z, cosine z by their usual series to a complex value functions of a complex variable. Then we shall see that they have similar properties to the functions of real ones that you may know. Okay. So today lecture is about formal power series. <laughs> so first of all, let's select a neutral letter T writing a formal power series that is written something in form like this. And uh, the th things that are important are the coefficients, the a0, a1, a2. And uh, there are complex numbers, so we, so a power series can be viewed as a function from n to a n, from integers to complex numbers. And there are many notations of uh, writing a power series, right? Notice here f is not a function, but it is a formal expression. And uh, we write a single term, this, to denote the power series that ak is 0 if k is not equal to n. So this will denote the power series, this. Okay? <laughs> and we call a naught, which is the very first term, a naught. We call it the constant term of a power series. And we could define the sum of two power series. If we give it f and g, we define f plus g as uh another power series where cn is each an plus vn. And the product of two power series where dn is equal to this. Well, this is defined just as our polynomials. So the first few terms of product can be viewed as a0, b0, a0, b1, a1, b0, a0, b2, a1, b1, a2, b0, okay? So this is how we define the product of two power series. <laughs> Just exactly the same as how we did for polynomials. And uh, yeah, the sum and product are associative, commutative, distributive. Right, this is like we have the distributivity here. <laughs> the proof is just elementary algebra. It's like if you know the results for polynomials, then it comes to formal power series, it would define it as like exact same way. <laughs> okay. And other than that, we can still define a scalar multiplication of a power series. We define alpha times f, where alpha is a complex number, to be alpha times a n, the coefficients are alpha times a n to t n. Okay? And we can check this is true because of properties of complex numbers. Okay? And the zero power series is a series such that... Um, Like nothing at all, like zero, 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 right? And suppose a power is of the form that looks like this, and the first term is non-zero. R is the smallest integer n such that the coefficient doesn't vanish. Such R is the order, right? So R will be the order of f. If order of g is equal to s, right, then fg will be equal to this which means that the order of fg will be, as you can guess, which would be the order of f plus the order of g, right? <laughs> this is the order, right? Just as for polynomials, just like I mentioned, right? And the uh, power series has order zero if the constant term is non-zero, okay? And for a power series, we see that this is an inverse if their product gives you 1, which is 1 plus t plus, sorry, 1 plus 0t plus 0t squared plus da da da. This is the, uh, the, uh, the 1 power series. So, uh, if an inverse exists, then we must have their order to be 0, right? Because 1 is like the constant, like if two power series multiply it out, their constant term should be non-zero such that their, their product gives you 1, right? And the converse is also true. This is that 
if you have a non-zero constant, then you have an inverse. What we showed is that if you have an inverse, then your constant term should be non-zero. But here, if a constant term is non-zero, then it has an inverse as a power series. So the proof is that we need to determine whether or not there exists a formal power series such that fg is equal to 1, right? So if we just expand the product like this, so this is the formula for the product, and we compare the coefficient on both sides of this. So fg will be looks like this. And this should be 0, 0, and a0, b0, a0, b0 should be equal to 1. If f has a non-zero constant term, so which means that a0 is non-zero, which means we can define b0 as 1 over a, a0. Right, so here means that each equation after that, like because we have the formula of b0 here, right, so we can solve for b1, right, a0, like from here we have a0, b1 plus a1, b0 is equal to 0, right, then b1, a0, b1 will be equal to negative a1, b0. And if it's like this, so suppose that we we already solved b1, so b1, we know b1, we know b0, so b2, right, a0, b2 will be equal to a1, b1 plus a2, b0, so it will be looking looking like some summation like this, right? And uh, a0, so we want to isolate bk, so we divide by 1, so we multiply by 1 over a0 on both sides, right, which is exactly the same as multiplying b0. So we have a formula for bk, which is looks like this. And these equations can be solved by induction, right? Yielding a solution, which gives the multiplicative inverse. Therefore, f has an inverse, OK? So as an example, let's define cosine t as a formal power series that looks like this, OK? We want to write a few terms of this. So if we just apply the formula, right? The B0 should be equal to 1, the B1, like the B2, B3, like we, if we just compare this with our formula, right, we can just compute them, okay? Now, let F be another power series. Let HT be another power series whose constant term is 0, right? So the order must be greater than or equal to 1. Then we can substitute h and f to define another power series, f of h. So this is a new definition. f of h of t is equal to defined as f of h, which is uh, a0 plus a1h plus a2h squared plus a3h3. So this doesn't make sense for now, right? But the finite sums are defined by ordinary sum and product of power series, right? And notice that if m is greater than n, then a m h m has order greater than n, right? Which means that, in other words, it is a power series starting with non-zero terms of order greater than n. So, so, right? So we can just define the power series whose nth coefficient is the nth coefficient of this finite sum. Okay, so this is a definition. This composition of power series, like addition and multiplication, can therefore be computed working with polynomials. Okay, so we're gonna discuss more on this substitution. Before that, we need a definition that we say two series are congruent mod Tn, if, and we write it like this. If the a n and b n, a and b n agree from zero to n minus one, this means that a term of order less than n coincides for the two power series. Okay, this is our definition. So, given the power series, there exists a unique polynomial, right? That looks like uh, that is congruent with f of t, right? Which is exactly this, right? Okay, so this is a remark. So here's our theorem that 
If F1, F2 congruent, G1, G2 congruent, then F1 plus G1 is congruent with F2 plus G2. So does your product. Okay. If H1, H2 are power series with, non, uh, with a zero constant term, and they are congruent, then F of H, F1, H1 is congruent with F2, H2. Okay, so F1 congruent F2, H1 congruent H2, then F1, H1 congruent with H, F2, H2. So let's just first prove this result, okay? Um, the sum and product follows by definitions, okay? Like, this should be easy enough to see because, right, it just follows by definition. But this is the tricky part of uh, composition. So, first of all, as I remarked, will in P1, P2 be the polynomials of degree n minus 1 such that, right, P1 is congruent to F1, P2 congruent to F2, right? Okay, so first of all, from this, suppose H has zero constant term. Then F1 of H, like just by our definition, and P1 of H is a finite sum and product of H. So this is a power series. This is another power series. But for, let's just fix N, let's just fix the range from one to N. The nth coefficient is the nth coefficient of this, right? This is our definition of composition. But what is the nth coefficient of this? The nth coefficient of this. So first of all, by the definition of sum of formal power series, okay, the, co the nth coefficient of them should be the sum of the nth coefficients of them, which is the sum of the nth coefficients of a k to the h to the power of k. Okay, this is by the definition of sum of power series. Right, the nth coefficient of this thing is actually the sum of the nth coefficient of each a k h to the k. Okay, well, again, right, by the definition of the sum. A formal power series, right, is actually the nth coefficient of this, right? Remember, we have this range n, right? So the nth co uh, the sum of nth coefficient of those, right? Because, like, if, if m, if we have m greater than n, then a m h m. This has the nth coefficient should be zero, right? So this is why I only let k run from one to n, right? Because by the actual definition, it is the nth, um, the nth coefficient of this. Is the nth coefficient of this plus the nth coefficient of this plus the nth coefficient of this until nth coefficient of this, right? But the nth coefficient of this is zero, right? Until like a n h n, right? And if a n plus one h n plus one, the nth coefficient of this is also zero, right? The nth coefficient of this is also zero. So that is why it is sum of nth coefficient from one to n, right? Again. By the definition of sum of formal power series, sum of the nth coefficients of those, which is exactly the nth coefficients of this sum. Okay, forget about the a not first. It is the nth coefficient of this sum, right? But, right, this is the definition of sum of formal power series. Now, we just add a n because it's just zero, right? Here is like, it's also zero, the nth coefficient of this is zero, so it doesn't matter, but at least they look the same. Thus, for all those n, they have the same nth coefficient, which means that we can conclude this, right? And similarly, right, f2h congruent to p2h, not n. And because F1 and F2 are congruent, 
right? So we have this, which means that P1 and P2 are congruent. But that precisely means that P1 is equal to P2. Thus, we have this, okay? We have this. Now, for the power series H, we let Q be another polynomial such that H1, H2, and Q congruent, Tn. Let's write, T, uh, write P in the form of this. Then P of H1, right, we just substitute in as a power series. This is actually congruent to if you replace H1 by Q because they're congruent. And Q can uh, get replaced by H2, which is P of H2. So this is a bit jumping, right? But we can explain this. The second congruent holds because if we just write H as the sum, the nth coefficient of that, we require this, right? The nth coefficient of pH1, which is this, the nth coefficient of pH1 is the sum of the nth coefficient of those, right? For, for K from, okay, it's from, it doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter. And we know that, we know that if you want to uh, verify this, right, we just check each of those summands, right? Because um, the nth coefficient is the sum of, sum of the nth coefficient of those, right? And we just check each of those because we want to verify these two are congruent Tn, right? So the constant term doesn't matter for now. We just want to compare them, right? So the nth coefficient of H1 is again, right? Same as the nth coefficient of Q. Well, what if it comes to H2, H1 squared, right? The nth coefficient is one squared. It's a sum of numbers that looks like this, right? If you write H like this for B, I, B, J, right? Um, correct? It is where I, J runs from one to N. We need less to n because h1 has zero constant terms, so no nothing like this will appear, right? So such summation is the same as the nth coefficient of q squared, because h1 and q are congruent, and those only runs from one to n, where n is again less than big n, right? But they are congruent t n, right? So all those things they are the same. Again, by induction, right? One can see that the nth coefficient of H1K is the sum of numbers that looks like something like this. I1, I2, Ik, where I1, again, there is strictly less than n. Such summation is the same as the nth coefficient of Q to the K because H1 and Q are congruent. Thus, right? If H1, Q, uh, sorry. If h1, q, h1 squared, q squared, h dot dot dot, h1, k, q to the k, having the same nth coefficient. If they have the same nth coefficient, then, I mean for k, for all k, right? For all uh, k n minus one, right? If I have the same nth coefficient for all those, then the linear combination still having the same nth coefficient, right? So this is why we have, this is true. Their nth coefficient are the same for all n from one to n minus one. So this congruent holds. And again, right by uh by some mirror, sorry, by some mirror, uh mirror argument, by symmetry or whatever, right, H two and Q, which means that the third congruence holds, okay, so this is verified. Now, finally, with with the this thing we had at every beginning, right? Remember we have this at the very beginning. If we just plug in, we have F1H1 congruent to PH1. 
and pH 1, pH 1 is congruent to pH 2, right? Congruent to pH 2, and pH 2 is, is equal to P2H2, right, which is F2H2. So F1, H1, F2, H2 are congruent, which proves the desired property. Okay, so all this is just matching coefficient and verify the equality of them. Okay, so we have this following theorem. Now let's move on. With these rules, you can compute the coefficients of various operations between power series by reducing computations to polynomial operations. Because two power series are equal, if only if they are congruent for all n, right? And verifying this, it can be done by working entirely with polynomials, right? So here we have the theorem. Give it two power series, then the f1 plus f2 is another power series, right? So f1 f plus f2 of h is actually the same as f1 of h plus f2 of h. Same as the product and also the quotient, where here the quotient, if the order of f2 is equal to zero, right? So non-zero constant term, right? Has an inverse, okay? And if g and h both have uh, zero constant terms, then f of g of h is equal to f of g of h. Okay, so this is the, like, the associate associativity law of composition. So let's just prove this first, so you can get a taste to prove the general one. The, 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 this is like the one here. So, okay. Um, let's just prove this sum, sum first. So give it positive integer n, let p r q be polynomials degree such that this is true. Okay, so this is our initial setting. Now, by I just copy paste directly from the proof of last theorem, right? F one H and P Q are congruent, right? Because F one H and P one H will be congruent. I mean P, right? F one is P, so F one H congruent with P H, but um p of h right which is this h h n minus one remember h is congruent with q so we will get this is true right so which is this is equal to p of q okay so f on h will be equal to p of q <clears throat> so what do we have from the last theorem is that if f1 and p are congruent h and q are congruent the f1 of h is congruent to p of q. Okay, so similarly, f2 of h, f2 of h is congruent to r of q. f1 plus f2 is congruent to p plus r. This is by the definition of sum of power series and the definition of sum of polynomials. So this congruent to this, so this of h will be congruent to this of q, right? But p, q, p of q plus r of q and p plus r of q are the same as polynomials. Thus, we have the equality here, here, right? And this is down here and uh, this, right? P Q plus R Q, P Q is congruent to this, R Q is congruent to this, so their sum is also congruent, right? So this is true for each n, which gives that they're equal. We have the congruent holds for each n, which gives the equality. Now, like from this, right, we can see that it all reduces to the equality for polynomials, right? P times R of Q is equal to P of Q times R of Q. Quotient, similar. And for the associativity of composition, composition, so let P R Q be polynomials such as F P congruent G R H Q. Okay, so again, G of H will be congruent to R of Q, 
right? So, which, which means that f of this will be congruent to p of this. So f of g of h will be congruent to p of r of q, right? But we also have f of g is congruent to p of r, okay? Or f of g is, uh, if this makes you more comfortable, f of g of t, right? p of r of t, right? Because, well, again, f and p congruent, g and r congruent, so f of g will be congruent to p of r. This is actually equal to p r, okay? p of r. But p of r of q will be just written as p of r of q. Okay, this is just a different way of writing. Okay, just don't get confused. If you're actually confused with this, just write it on a sheet of paper. So f of g will be f of g of t, right? And p of r will be p of r, right? Then p of r of q, right? This will be equal to p of p circ r q. This is what it means, right? So these two are the same, okay? this and this. So of H is P of R of Q, right? And we have this, well, they're the same because as in polynomials, hence this congruent gives this equality, pass it again to a congruent, and this is true for each n, so this equality holds. The composition of power series are associated. So this is everything for this lecture on form of power series, and I'll see you guys next time. We're going to talk about convergence power series.